the Famicom begins its Steel Ball Run. It's NES Works Gaiden Episode 47. Yada yada does it. Well, it had to happen eventually. Pachinko has arrived on Famicom. Honestly, it took a lot longer than you might have expected, based on the ill tidings of other platforms we've explored here. I mean, when Sega launched the SG-1000, Pachinko showed up within the first six months. And when Pachinko turned out to be a dud, or glitchy, I'm not sure which, they recalled it, and Pachinko 2 followed a few months later. That's a lot of front-loaded Pachinko for a single console to endure. Famicom, at least, has close to 100 games at this point to help soak up the misery. So far as I can tell, Pachinko for SG-1000 brought Japan's favorite gambling addiction to consoles for the first time ever, and it pretty much cemented how this genre works in video game form. As in Sega's game, Pachicom offers the player two forms of input, the ability to launch balls and the ability to modify how much force you launch them with. This being an early in-ROM-based recreation of Pachinko, Pachicom offers nothing more than the fundamentals. Eventually, developers would attempt to set their pachinko titles apart from dozens of identical games in which you basically do nothing by adding various efforts at interactivity, such as pachinko times metagame elements, or even role-playing mechanics. Here, at the tail end of 1985, Pachicom didn't need to go the extra mile. The fact that it was the sole pachinko sim available for the best-selling console in Japan essentially guaranteed sales. As I've mentioned before, pachinko has genuine cultural cachet. And I was not surprised to see on a recent trip to Tokyo that COVID doesn't appear to have dimmed the Blue Hair's enthusiasm for lining up in the morning and diligently launching ball bearings into a cacophonous din. But the good news is that Pachicom offers something for us, too. And by us, I mean people whose interests lay in video game history rather than in Pachinko. Pachicom has the infamous distinction of being one of several Famicom titles to contain a frothy text rant by one of its programmers. Although nowhere near as unpleasant as the vaguely misogynistic screed unearthed in Namco's Erikato Satoru no Yume Boken a decade ago, Pachicom devotes a remarkable amount of its limited cartridge space to an embittered takedown of what appears to be Nintendo and Pachicom publisher Toshiba EMI. Pachicom is sort of the anti Super Mario Brothers, where that game made use of every last bit of data storage available on its ROM. Pachicom had so much space left over there was room for 1985's equivalent of an epic green text rant. You can find the full missive at the cutting room floor, but in short, someone on the Pachicom team had no particular fondness for the Famicom hardware or the management level interference they had to deal with in bringing this sparkling masterpiece to life. Also, this programmer thinks that you, yes you, are a pervert. Honestly, this might be the first evidence we've seen in the Famicom age of the heavy toll that development crunch exacts on creators. And I have to say, Pachicom's angry creator wasn't entirely wrong. One of his complaints involved the fact that his team was forced to incorporate constant beeping and siren sounds into the game by a producer. Although the constant ear-splitting wall of sound does make Pachicom quite an authentic recreation of an actual pachinko parlor, our opinionated programmer wanted a quieter rendition of the game the focus less on the blare of sirens and more on the constant ping of the balls flying into the machine. And he even provided instructions in his rant for editing hex code to switch to his preferred sound style. Even with the alternate sounds though, this is still just a pachinko video game. A game about doing very little while watching a number grow larger. Pachicom attempts some form of innovation by offering hundreds of different tables, but don't go expecting radically varied layouts. After all, this is a game with so much leftover storage space that someone could use the leftover memory to scream angrily into the void. No, toggling between alternate boards simply modifies individual elements of the tables, usually by ever so slightly altering the design of the bumpers that channel the balls toward the bottom of the screen. Oh, and the little guy who appears on the title screen will also scurry out into the playing field to retrieve a ball if you manage to get it stuck, a rare but not impossible occurrence. Personally, I'd have preferred for this to have been a game about helping the little guy unjam pachinko machines while dodging steel balls, but I am not a producer at Toshiba EMI, so what do I know? In addition to being Toshiba EMI's first Famicom release, Pachicom also sees the platform's debut for a developer called Bears, with an apostrophe, which splintered off of Data East 
and focused on computer and console games. Bears with an apostrophe would go on to create some deeply mediocre Famicom releases, some of which would unfortunately make their way to the US, before changing its name to show a system and creating a bunch of early Game Boy releases that will probably look familiar to longtime VideoWorks viewers. Most of those were pretty bad too, but none of them had fun programmer rants hidden in their code. So as far as I'm concerned, this developer peaked early. Weirdly enough, Pachycomb has a fateful connection to the next game that would ship for Famicom. The famously ranty programmer signed his name YS, and one of YS's co-workers was another programmer by the name of Yoshiaki Kishimoto. According to Game Developers Research Institute, Kishimoto came over to Bears with an apostrophe from Data East, where he programmed a few arcade titles, including Peter Pepper's Ice Cream Factory. As it happens, Peter Pepper's Ice Cream Factory was none other than the sequel to a major Golden Age arcade hit whose Famicom port would eventually make its way to NES, Burger Time. Perhaps the most striking thing about the Famicom release of Burger Time comes not from how it plays or looks, which is respectably on both counts, but rather from the name on the box. This SAS Cicada developed port of a Data East arcade hit that shipped under the Data East label on NES appeared in Japan courtesy of Namco. This phenomenon cropped up from time to time in the early days of the Famicom, a well-known video game company publishing under another corporation's label. I mean, it still happens, but in Famicom's formative years, you occasionally saw companies that would later publish for NES bootstrapping their way into the market through an established publisher. I don't know if this had to do with risk aversion as developers tested the waters to see if the Famicom would be a viable platform for their business, or if it simply gave them a shortcut to the market while they waited for Nintendo's blessing to begin conducting business on their own. I've read that the third parties who supported Famicom earliest, such as Namco and Hudson, enjoyed special publishing privileges. So that could be a factor as well. Whatever the reason, Namco published Data East's first few Famicom releases prior to the developer leaving the nest to fly on its own, appropriately enough with April 1986's B-Wings. But Burger Time seems like a pretty fitting game for Namco to publish in any case. It's a solid port of a classic arcade hit from the same time period that most of Namco or Namcot's releases to date have hailed from. The game features a tiny chef named Peter Pepper who needs to build hamburgers in the most unsanitary way imaginable, by walking over their individual components. His toils are complicated by the presence of hostile foods that want to murder him, presumably having been sent by the Department of Sanitation in retaliation for meandering all over their Whopper Juniors. Peter can fight back with his namesake. Blasting murder morsels with a burst of pepper will briefly stun them, allowing Peter Pepper to slip past safely in a pinch. You can also destroy the killer condiments by collapsing burger components onto them, presumably incorporating them into your sandwich creation. So the next time you eat a burger that tastes like someone tracked boot grime onto it, and it contains a tiny violent wiener or egg inside its layers, say a quiet prayer of thanks to Peter Pepper and his tireless efforts to assemble your lunch, no matter how filthy his feet, or aggro the pickles. Sometimes great games go unrewarded, failing to make a dent on sales or an impression on players despite their excellence. And sometimes games do extraordinarily well despite their real lack of merits. I invite you to guess which one of these describes Sunsoft's Iki. Iki had a certain charm in its original arcade incarnation, a top-down shooter set in feudal Japan. If I had to describe it in terms of other video games, which seems reasonable given Sunsoft's love for adopting other people's ideas and building something new for them, I called a cross between Sega's Ninja Princess and Namco's Rally X. Yes, this is two Sunsoft games in a row that substantially resemble Rally X. Honestly, given the way the rest of the industry lifted from Pac-Man, it's nice to see its companion game given some love. Iki stood apart from something like Ninja Princess or Frontline by virtue of its free scrolling. Rather than simply advancing forward and possibly back, Iki allowed players to move in all directions around fairly large environments, which varied from fields to castles. Iki's theme centered on a peasant uprising in feudal Japan, which consisted of a single guy named Gombei running around collecting cash while murdering legions of the daimyo's men with throwing sickles. The Rally X component comes into play with the game's objectives. The cash Gombei gathers, I guess he's reclaiming tax payments, appears all around each level. You need to collect eight coins in order to advance to another stage, and you can spot the location of these coins by checking the minimap in the right margin of the screen. 
Well, that's the case in the arcade version anyway. On Famicom, developer Tosei kinda skipped that feature, which makes their home port of Iki a lot more difficult. You just have to poke around the stages hunting for coins until you luck into them all. At this point, I think we can safely say that everyone has figured out multi-directional scrolling on Famicom, so the fairly large layouts of Iki's stages don't seem especially amazing. They're just annoying, mainly because Iki has perhaps the most unreasonable scrolling design yet seen on the console. To move the viewpoint in any direction, you basically have to press right up against the screen boundary. You can only see about two tiles ahead while walking into new territory, which makes the scrolling design in Ninja Princess look downright generous, and it leaves you constantly vulnerable to attack by enemies you can't see until they appear on screen a few inches from your face. To compensate for this, Iki allows you to attack foes freely in all directions with your sickles through the incorporation of an auto-aim mechanic. Toss a weapon and it will automatically target any on-screen foe, or at least any hostile human foe anyway. Certain enemies don't register as viable targets, like the spirits that attempt to latch onto you and prevent you from attacking, and the horrible enthusiastic woman who wants to bombard Gombe with an embrace that locks him into place. But if it's a ninja, Gombe will automatically chuck a blade at it. While your projectiles lock onto foes, that's only true up to the instant you release one. A sickle will target the position of an enemy when you toss it, but if that enemy moves away from its trajectory, your attack will fly wide rather than homing in. This shapes your combat tactics. Rather than chucking blades blindly, you're better off firing tactically and throwing along an enemy's axis of movement. Of course, that only works if you can't actually see the enemy coming, which, at the leading edge of the scroll direction, you can't. Iki does at least incorporate the scenery into the action, treating walls, partitions, and shrubbery as barriers. You can't throw sickles through these obstacles or move through them, but neither can your enemies. The action in Iki moves at a rapid clip, so putting walls between yourself and the daimyo's hordes whenever possible does a lot to maximize your survival. Unfortunately, the clunky scrolling design turns some of the more complicated layouts into absolute death traps as you push into winding passages where death may lay unseen a few inches from Gombe's stupid face in any direction. Iki also includes a few power-ups, like a daikon that gives Gombe a much-needed burst of speed, and a bamboo pole that replaces your all-range, all-direction sickles with a short-range strike that only points upward. This honestly seems like a massive downgrade, and turns the bamboo icon into something you desperately want to avoid even more carefully than enemy shuriken. Speaking of downgrades, Iki on Famicom only contains four stages to the arcade's eight, though if a game isn't enjoyable to play, is having to deal with less of it a step down or a step up? In fairness, Iki isn't the worst game we've seen so far in Famicom, it isn't even the worst game this episode. But it might be the most frustrating due to its compromised design and unfortunate changes from the arcade version. That didn't stop it from absolutely racking up sales though. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that Iki put Sunsoft on the map, giving the company an enormous war chest as its best-selling self-publisher release ever. Nothing else Sunsoft would produce for Famicom would sell this well. But many of those games would be all-timers, and they probably wouldn't have happened had it not been for Iki. So there's that, I guess. Unsurprisingly, Sunsoft has a soft spot for the game, having revisited it several times throughout the years. They took it online with a mobile title, Iki Online, a few years back, and recently announced a new version of Iki for current-gen consoles that takes inspiration from Vampire Survivors, of all things. You wouldn't think it to play this frustrating and underwhelming game, but, well, that's video game history for you. Sometimes, it just doesn't make sense. Next time on NES Works Guide In, only murders in this building.